Hi everyone, my name is Katie Fry and I'm the interim head librarian at the Center for Astrophysics. And I'm very excited to introduce our speaker for today's favorite office hours. Um, and that would be Dr. Caroline Huang. Uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow here at the Center for Astrophysics. She obtained her PhD in 2019 at John Hopkins University and her AB in Physics and Astrophysics from Harvard University in 2013. At the Center for Astrophysics, she works to understand the properties of stars in the last stages of their life, and to use those stars to determine the distances to nearby galaxies in order to study the expansion rate of the universe. In some ways, her work is actually a descendant of the work that Ms. Henrietta Leavitt undertook in the early 1900s to measure the distances between stars. So today, Dr. Huang will be talking with us about how she used the Phaedra notebooks in her research and how the two new notebooks that we just put online may be valuable to scientists at the CFA. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, the nice introduction. Um, let me share my slides. Okay, so hi everyone. As Katie said, my name is Caroline Huang and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the CFA. Um, this is my first time giving a sort of historical-ish talk like this, so hopefully it's understandable. Um, and I'm going to talk about some things that I've learned from using data from the Phaedra survey, or from Project Phaedra. And what I have showing in the background here is actually uh, modern observations of this dwarf galaxy near us called the Small Magellanic Cloud. Um, and the Small Magellanic Cloud data analyzed by Henrietta Swan Levitt is going to be the focus of most of my talk. And towards the end, I'll also talk a little bit about things we want to do in the future with another star you may have heard of called Betelgeuse. Okay, so I'm assuming most Smithsonian Transcription Center volunteers are aware of this, but just so we're all on the same page, uh, these notebooks, a lot of them were um, kept and written by the Harvard computers which were women hired by Edward C. Pickering in the late 1800s and early 1900s that did a lot of what we call data reduction of photographic plates. So basically what that means is when we take pictures of uh, stars, um, we can't then directly use those images to do research. What we actually want out of the images is maybe the positions of the stars and how bright they are, and other sort of calculations that we can derive from the images. So these women were doing that job. And the reason why he hired women is because it was a lot cheaper than hiring men. Um, these women were paid from like less than half of what men at the time were paid. And he needed a large number of people to do this job because already at that time, there was more astronomical data then could be handled by the number of ast astronomers. So their work was integral, um, even if they were sort of taken advantage of, but it was also for many of them, the only way that they were able to actually break into this field. And so today I'm gonna focus primarily on the work of Henrietta Swan Levitt, one of these computers. Um, and actually, I think she's the one, uh, my mouse disappeared, so I can't point at anyone, but I think she's like standing towards the middle of this photograph. Um, okay, so a little introduction to Henrietta Swan Levitt. So she was born in Massachusetts on July 4th, 1868. Um, and she went to Radcliffe College where she got a bachelor's degree. And after that, she became one of these Harvard computers, these women that were doing a lot of routine work, um, writing down magnitudes, which is how bright stars are and where they were on the images and in the sky. So even though this work was very rote, a lot of them actually discovered, made huge paradigm shifting discoveries in astronomy, and Henrietta was one of them. Um, but sadly, she died in December of 1921 um, of stomach cancer, and she didn't actually live to see the impact of her work, which would come just a few years later. So in fact, in 1925, there was the mathematician Gustav Mittag Lefner who actually attempted to nominate her for the Nobel Prize only to discover that she'd already died. And of course you can't win that posthumously. And Edwin Hubble, who himself is also a very famous astronomer had also suggested that she should have won the Nobel Prize. Um, 
But her colleagues were saddened by her death, not just because of her brilliant scientific mind, but also because she just sounded like a wonderful person. So in her obituary, they wrote that she had the happy, joyful faculty of appreciating all that was worthy and lovable in others, and was possessed of a nature so full of sunshine that to her, all of life became beautiful and full of meaning. So that sounds like a very nice thing to write about someone. So we should remember that she was not only like a brilliant scientist, but also a great person. So I think recently more light has been shed on the work of these Harvard, computer, or Harvard computers and also women computers elsewhere with movies like Hidden Figures, which talked about the female computers that worked in the early days of NASA. Um, and also in, for Henrietta Swan Levitt, there's been a play uh, called Silent Sky. So we do understand this context a bit better now, but I think we still often don't recognize just how good her research was. And that's what I hope to illuminate a little bit today. So given that um, the audience is transcription volunteers, I'm assuming that a lot of people got their introduction through to Henrietta Leavitt through looking at her notebooks and her beautiful handwriting. So one of the notebooks that we specifically focused on was her notebook looking at the small Magellanic cloud, which is the galaxy, the dwarf galaxy that I showed in the background of my title slide. Um, it's very nearby. And she was specifically focusing on looking at variable stars in this galaxy. So variable stars are stars that are varying in brightness, as the name suggests. Basically, they go from being fainter to brighter. And this is significant because stars all change, but most of these changes happen on such large time scales that we're not around to observe them. But for variable stars, these changes happen on small enough time scales, sometimes from seconds to days or years, that we in our human lifetimes can actually see it. And it happens on a large enough scale that we can actually measure it. So. Henrietta was studying some of these stars that were varying in the small Magellanic clouds. And as you can see here, she was writing down what they what their measurements were when they were at their brightest and their faintest. And this is a picture of her at work, maybe even on this notebook. I don't know. Um, I just thought it was a cute picture. Okay, so I wanna show a video. I don't know if this is gonna work. So we may need to be a little patient at this point. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll go to my other screen where I have this video open. So the reason why I want to show this video is that in astronomy, we often have this issue that is going to be illustrated here. Um, can you see this black screen? Okay, great. Okay, one last time. These are small but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> Small, far away. Yes. Okay, so basically what I wanted to illustrate is that when he holds up the cows, we know that the cows are, um, small when he's holding up the little cows. And we also know that the cows outside are far away, even though they look the same size, because we already know how big a cow is. But in our case, in astronomy, we don't actually know how big things are. Oops, sorry, this is the wrong page in my... <laughs> Let me find my keynote again. Okay. Um, but in astronomy, we don't actually know how big things are. Um, and so because we don't know how big things are, we don't know if we're looking at something that's small or if we're looking at something that's far away. And things in astronomy are really, really far away. So measuring how far away is super hard. So for example, the nearest star Proxima Centauri is four light years away. So a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. Um, and so there's no real way that we, there's no way on earth that we would ever like have to deal with distances of that size. So now we have to think about how we can measure distances to astronomical objects in order to decide if when we look at galaxies, are they small 
or are they far away? And when we look at stars, if they're bright or just nearby. So knowing their distances helps us answer these questions. So on Earth, the way that we've measured distances to things that are kind of far away is basically through parallax or triangulation. And so this is a method that's been used for thousands of years. And without going into details about it, basically the idea is that you're drawing triangles and using trigonometric relationships to distant objects to figure out how far it is. So you usually are going to look at something from two different angles and measure how much it's changed and how far you've walked to get to that. And then you can derive with trigonometry how far away that is. So this diagram on the left is actually a Sea Island Survey diagram from the Chinese mathematician Liu Hui in uh, the 200s. And he's showing here how you can measure the height of this sea island, even though it's not nearby you. And so the first stellar parallax uh, that is applying this method to stars was determined much later in the 1830s by Frederick Bessel. And the reason why this is, is because we needed telescopes. The stars are extremely far away. So in order to accurately measure these tiny angles, we needed something better than the human eye. And that wasn't possible before telescopes. So today our best stellar parallaxes can reach 16,000 light years. So they can easily reach to the nearest stars, but 16,000 light years is still much smaller than the distance between us and the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So the center of our galaxy is about 26,000 light years away or so from us. So we can see that if we want to actually study things outside of our own galaxy, we need to be able to do much, much better than stellar parallax. So that's where um, Henrietta's Levitt, Henrietta Levitt's work comes in. So what Henrietta discovered was actually the first standard candle. Um, and standard candle is basically just the way the name sounds. So if we have something of a fixed luminosity, basically of a brightness that we know, then just like with the cow, we can tell if it's far away if it's fainter, and we can tell if it's closer if it's brighter. So that's what this diagram is illustrating. You have the same candle, but as you put it farther away, it's getting fainter. And now we know based off of how, comparing the relative brightnesses, how far away that candle is. And next to it is a ruler showing the same concept, which is um, a standard ruler is something where we know its size and we can compare its size nearby and far away and figure out these distances. And so this is really useful because the stars that Henrietta Levitt were studied, she found, all had a brightness that could be decided by um, uh, all had the same brightness. So if she could find the same population of stars in a farther away galaxy or environment, she would then be able to measure its difference, its, its distance by comparing the difference between that farther away galaxy and the nearby one. So we can see stars much farther away than we can see their tiny motions. So this is what allows us to go way, way farther than our own galaxy in measuring distances. So I mentioned earlier that parallax can reach about 16,000 light years um, using these standard candles that Henrietta herself discovered. We can reach, I think it's kind of hard because we don't actually use light years in astronomy, so I'm trying to convert it, like about 200 million, 200 million light years away. So much farther away than we were previously able to reach. Okay, so there was some immediate impact of her work. Um, her paper with, uh, with Pickering was published in 1912. And in 1920, there was this thing called the Great Debate, which was basically between two very famous astronomers, uh, Curtis and Shapley. And this was about the size of the universe. They were trying to decide how big the universe was um, because we really didn't know. And Curtis was on the side that the universe is much bigger than we think. And Shapley was on the side that the universe is bigger, but not that much bigger. So to go into what they were arguing about, in the middle is just an astronomical photograph. Mm -hmm. And this photograph is a negative, meaning that the brighter sources are shown darker 
and the background, which we're not seeing any light from, is bright. And we often show um, images this way because it's often easier to identify things than the other way around. But in addition to these point-like things that you can see throughout the image, which are stars, you also see some fuzzy blobs, and they call these spiral nebulae. So we know today that these are galaxies, but at the time, and so a galaxy is basically like our galaxy, the Milky Way is composed of many, many stars. And there's other galaxies much farther away that are also composed of many stars. But at the time, Curtis thought that these galaxies were like our own Milky Way and farther away. And Shapley thought that these fuzzy blobs were actually part of the Milky Way, so much closer to us. So they were really debating how big the universe was. And I think at the time, many people concluded that Shapley, who believed the universe was a lot smaller, had actually won this debate. Um, but time has shown that Curtis was right. So this debate was eventually resolved by Edwin Hubble, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he used the stars that Henrietta discovered to measure the distances to nearby uh, spiral nebulae and find that they were well outside of the Milky Way. And this completely changed how large we thought the universe was, because now we realize that there were things outside of the Milky Way. And so this is Edwin on the Edwin Hubble on the left. And then in 1929, he created another huge paradigm shift for astronomy because he used Levitt's uh, standard candles that she had developed to measure distances to faraway galaxies. And what he found was that the farther away a galaxy it was, the faster it was moving away from us. So what this, this doesn't sound maybe that interesting right off the bat, but what it actually means is that he found the universe was expanding. And the reason why is because if everything farther away from us is moving faster than things closer to us, either there's a grand cosmic conspiracy where all the galaxies decided to do to just get away from us, or the space between us and those galaxies is actually growing. And there's more space between us and the galaxies farther away. So that um, those galaxies look like they're moving away faster from us. So this was also a complete paradigm shift because at the time, um, some people thought the universe was static and it wasn't getting any bigger or smaller. So I could go on and on about all the things that Henrietta Leavitt's work led to, but these are like some of the most prominent examples. And sadly, uh, both of these things happened maybe only five to 10 years after her death and she didn't get to see that. So Edwin Hubble is actually the reason why the Hubble Space Telescope is named the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, because that's how important his work was. But we don't have like a Levitt Space Telescope, which is kind of sad. Um, okay, so what exactly did she discover? I've mentioned that she discovered standard candles, but I didn't actually explain how they worked. So these are two plots from her paper. Um, and what she actually found was that if she looked at a subset of the variables she'd studied in the SMC, the small Magellanic cloud, sorry, uh, she found that the brighter variables were changing, they were varying more slowly than the fainter variables. And this is very useful because now, once we know how slow or fast that variable is varying, we know how bright it is relative to the others. So this is what actually told us um, what actually tells us the distance, this relation. So on the left, um, we have brightness on the y-axis and as for astronomers, the smaller the number, the brighter it is, um, which might sound weird. And then on the bottom axis is the period, which is the how long it takes for one cycle of variation to complete. And this is measured in days. And we can see that, uh, so these black points are her data, that the longer periods are brighter. Um, on the right, we have the same data, except that on the bottom axis, it's in log period or log days for period instead of just days. And the reason why is because this shows a more easy to like examine linear relationship. Um, so these are plots from her original paper. And what I did with a friend of mine who's also a postdoc, um, she's a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, and I'm hoping she'll eventually be able to come talk to people at Project Phaedra, uh, is we took her original data 
Um, and we sort of replotted it so we could look at it. And then we compared her original measurements with our best modern estimates. So on the left here, you see Levitt's plot. It's actually the same plot as on the right here, but just replotted using modern tools. And then on the right, we have the brightness um, and the periods derived from modern surveys. And in this case, the survey is called OGLE. Um, okay, so what's actually happening when we see these brightness changes? So for these variable stars, this, oh, oh, sorry, I meant to say that you can see they're very similar. And so what's actually happening when we see these changes in variable stars? Well, the star is actually physically getting bigger and smaller. And when the star is bigger, it's cooler. And when the star is smaller, it's hotter. And because of the relationship between brightness and temperature, actually, the star is brightest when it's smallest and hottest and faintest when it's largest and coolest, approximately. But what this little diagram shows is that it's repeating this cycle over and over again as time goes on. But what we can do um, is also like take data from different cycles because if the cycle is very consistent and plot it on top of itself and then examine it all at once instead of looking at really long plot. So most of the periods, which is this cycle variation that uh, Levitt determined agree extremely well with our modern observations. Um, in fact, the largest outlier was only off by 0.1 days. And her ability to determine the periods also seemed superhuman. So in one case, she had very little data. She only had about 22 observations, which sounds like a lot, but it spanned many years and almost 3,000 times of these cycles. And yet she was able to measure the period to within 12 minutes when compared to modern observations. So that's absolutely incredible. And we're not really sure how she did it. Um, but uh, so here's what our modern observations for these light curves look like. So earlier when I showed the modern plot and the Levitt plot, this is the data from that was used to derive uh, some of the sources in like these modern surveys. So what you actually see here is tons of tiny blue individual observations that are so small that you can hardly distinguish them. And it looks like they're basically just lines that I've drawn here. But these are observations taken over the course of many years that have then been put on top of each other by dividing by the period. So we determine what phase or what part of the cycle it's at. And then we just plot them all on top of each other. And we can see that they all line up so well that you basically can't really distinguish, like you can't distinguish them. They look almost like lines. So what this tells us is two things. One, that uh, the periods of these stars are actually very well determined because if we didn't, we would see them looking kind of fuzzy. and it also tells us that the periods of these stars are very stable, meaning that the periods are not changing so that we were actually able to put all the data on top of itself and it looks very consistent. And here's the data that Levitt was working with. So the, this is the data that actually um, this other postdoc and I went into the notebook, notebooks that Project Phaedra had transcribed, although we didn't know about the transcriptions at the time. So we transcribe these specific ones ourselves. Um, and we plotted them um, as a function of their phase and their magnitude. And you can definitely see the variations in the stars. And you can see that there is consistency because this was maybe like several decades of data and they all still sit mostly on top of each other. But at the same time, you can see that she was able to derive those relations working with much less information than we have today. And also she didn't have computers that could help her determine the periods in order to know how to create these plots. So that's extra incredible. Um, and because Levitt was so good at what she was doing, we actually uh, decided to re-examine one of the stars because her results were very different from, I mean, as far as her results go, they were very different compared to the other ones from modern estimates. So that was the case of this Cepheid called BZ Tuck or uh, HV821. So HV stands for Harvard Variable. Um, 
And so in this case, we thought that she would do a particularly good job measuring the period of this star because its period is very long. And if you've been paying attention, the periods in the previous diagrams are mostly on the order of one day or a few days. But this star's period is 127 days. So it's varying very slowly. And she also had some of the most observations for this star. So it should be easier for her to measure its period. Um, but instead, when we looked at her measurements, her results were very different, or they were off by a significant fraction of a day from our modern estimates, which is a lot for her. So we wanted to know why this was happening. And what we did was actually took some modern data and plotted it on itself. And the way I've um, plotted it here is that the red points are the oldest and the blue points are the newest. And you can actually see that from cycle to cycle, this star doesn't have that clean look that the other ones do. It doesn't, like if we go back to this slide, you don't really see any of that fuzziness, like all of the cycles, they just lie on top of each other. But here we're seeing that it sort of shifts. So at first we obviously considered if her period was wrong, but we actually couldn't find a period that was consistent with this star. So what that told us was that this star's period was actually varying. So there was no way she could have gotten the right answer because it was actually getting a longer and shorter period. And this is something that hasn't really been noted in the literature before. I could only find one reference that kind of suggested it in the nine, maybe eighties, but they that person didn't think it was a Cepheid because of it. So we know the classification is correct. What we actually know is that this star is experiencing changes in its pulsational period. So what I have shown here is what we call an O minus C diagram. So we predict when we expect to see the star at its peak of its light curve, and then we compare it with when we measure that. And what if these two agree, then we expect basically it'll all be zero. But instead what we see is these points keep varying around everywhere. So that suggests an unstable period. Okay, so I'm gonna end my section about Levitt there because uh, I think that's enough. And also um, I want the postdoc I've worked with to be able to share the parts that she's done as well. So I won't go into that. But now I'm gonna talk about um, another potential use case for the data that we have, which is in studying Betelgeuse. So um, if you don't know what Betelgeuse is, it's a very bright star that's in the Orion constellation. Um, and I think the brightest because it's Alpha Orionis. Um, and it recently in the past year, uh, oh, sorry, not year, I guess four years ago, you know, <laughs> underwent a very large change in how bright it was. So in January, 2019, it was pretty normal. And then starting in December of 2019, it got extremely faint, much fainter than we've seen in a hundred years of Betelgeuse observations. And this was very exciting to the astronomy community and to people in general, because uh, they started to wonder if this star was gonna be close to exploding as a supernova. And as it turns out, we no longer think that that's the case, but it was still a very significant change that we're trying to understand. And I've been working with um, some people here to understand this a little better. So one thing we can do with Betelgeuse is that Betelgeuse has, like the Cepheids I talked about previously, it has, uh, it's a variable star, but its variation is very inconsistent. So this is a plot from our paper earlier this year where we examine Betelgeuse data. Um, so at the top, you can see it's a light curve, basically the brightness over time. Um, and the data points are these black dots. And the fit that we used is this orange line. So we basically tried to fit the points to see what was going on. And what we found is that it's really hard to determine like a consistent period for Betelgeuse, which people had known before, but also after the great dimming event, which is what happened, which is this purple line, it seemed like its periodicity had gotten a lot shorter. And moreover, when we looked at the radial velocity, basically how the radial velocity is actually like how much the star is like 
moving closer to us and farther away from us, we seem to find that there was another period on top of this one that we're looking at. So the secondary period, which is called a long secondary period, is shown in the bottom here, there's this dashed green line. And as we can see, this secondary period is very, very long. So this set of data spans 11 years, but it doesn't even span two full cycles of the long secondary period. So 11 years is a lot of data in terms of astronomy, but uh, it's, and it's hard to get longer baselines sometimes. So one of the useful things I think about this Project Phaedra data is that we can look at stars that are experiencing these very long secondary periods. And if there are records in the Harvard College Observatory notebooks that are fully reduced, as in like they've done all of these calculations to calibrate the data, we could more easily find a way to compare that with our modern observations and get a longer span of observations with which to study more uh, repeated cycles of these long secondary periods. So that's part of our hope for these um, notebooks that uh, Katie and Rhiannon have put up. Um, we're hoping that with this set of notebooks, which are specifically uh, final data reductions, meaning that those astronomers have already done all the pre-processing of the data that we wouldn't be able to do now because we don't have those calibrations and we don't know what methods they would typically have used. It would be easier to use the stars from there and the information on those stars to compare to our modern observations. And it'll, it's very useful to study things that are changing very slowly for which we need a longer baseline of data. So I guess I'll mostly end here, but I just want to say that in addition to preserving this work that was paradigm shifting, uh, the notebooks also provide an unparalleled, base unparalleled baseline for some of the objects that these astronomers have studied. And so some of the applications I discussed today include um, maybe we can understand the evolutionary stage of Betelgeuse, like when it will explode. Um, we can study these long-term variability of stars, such as the long secondary period. And in the case of Henrietta's work, we were also able to discover some new things that we didn't know uh, were happening to a few of those stars. And we have some opportunities for interdisciplinary insights, like looking into just how good the quality of her work was, which hasn't really been touched upon um, yet. So that concludes my talk today. That's all I really wanted to share. So I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you so much, Caroline. That was really interesting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Glad you liked it. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, you have a question? Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, my question is actually two questions. How was the actual brightness measured when these people were looking at these uh, images? Mm -hmm. Was it eyeballed or was there some kind of instrument to determine the brightness? So it was pretty much eyeballed, but as Katie mentioned the other day, and I'm sure she can add more to this question, uh, they had these like fly swatter things <laughs> where they <laughs> compared, like they had some stars where they said, okay, this is like X magnitude, this is Y magnitude. And then they would hold that up to the image and compare which if it was brighter or fainter than the star they were looking at. So it was sort of eyeballed with a little help, I believe. Maybe Katie can clarify. Yeah, so I'm just showing an image here of, of a fly spanker. As Caroline oh, fly spanker, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these three are actually here at the observatory. And what they would do is um, take exposures of stars that they knew the brightness of um, and consistent exposure. So it is kind of hard to see in this image, but you can kind of see um, like a line of dots here that get from brighter to fainter and then brighter to fainter again. So they would make sure to make a fly spanker for each of the different um, emulsions that they were using. So because each emulsion would also kind of record the brightness differently, but they would make kind of this fly spanker for emulsion A versus another one for emulsion B. Um, and they would hold it up or kind of overlay it over the plate and see, okay, the, the, the brightness that they're looking at on the plate, which one does it match closest to? And that would be the magnitude of that star. So that was one of the methods that they used. 
so different observers would use the same fly swatter, so there wouldn't be variation between observers, correct? Yeah, and they also had magnifying devices called like, loops um, to, to zoom in on them and, and see the differences much more closely as well. Okay. Um, Philip, Philip, did you have a question? Actually, Hello? I had another question. Um, oh, okay. What, what causes the variability? Does Do the astronomers know that or is it? That, that's actually a very good question. Um, we do know that. Um, we don't know exactly the process for every single star or every kind of variability. But for the types, for the stars that Henrietta Leavitt studied, the Cepheids, we do actually know what causes that. So it's something that we call a kappa opacity mechanism. Um, and basically what's happening is that a star's entire life, it's like trying to not collapse. It's like a struggle between like the gravitational interact mass of the star, like trying to make it as tiny as possible and the star trying to survive. Um, by emitting energy through nuclear fusion, which like keeps the star from collapsing. So the star is like fusing um, mostly hydrogen to helium during most of its life in the very core. And that produces energy that travels outwards to the star and keeps it from collapsing. So, but it also causes these like temperature changes at different parts of the star. And um, one, so some stars like Cepheids, uh, they can have what's called a partial ionization zone. So stars are mostly hydrogen. And in a partial ionization zone, the hydrogen in that area is spends half of its time being ionized, meaning it doesn't have any electrons, and half of its time not being ionized. And this is really significant because ionized hydrogen and unionized hydrogen have really different opacities. And what that means is that um, an opacity is like how much photons it lets through, how much like energy from light it's letting through. So if this partial um, ionization zone is in the right part of the star, once it absorbs like light uh, photons from the nuclear fusion at the center of the star, it will then like take neutral hydrogen and ionize the hydrogen in that section. And then after it's completely ionized, the other electrons will just flow freely out of the star. And what that does is it makes the star get bigger and smaller because in one stage, it's letting all the photons out and another stage, it's absorbing like all of them. This is kind of approximate, but that's basically what's happening. And this process happens over and over again. And all stars have these zones, but for stars like Cepheids, the zones are in the exact right location in the star that it can drive the um, pulsations repeatedly. So you can imagine if the zone is like too close to the nuclear fusing core, then there's too much star outside of it for it to really push the star outwards much. And you won't really see that variation that much. And if it's too close to the surface, then you're also not really going to see it because it's only affecting that tiny layer outside of itself. So that's basically trying to explain it like as generally as possible what's happening. It's like a change in the opacity of the star in the interior. Um, we don't know for the long secondary period that I mentioned, we actually don't know what causes that. That is one of the things that we want to study. Um, it could be caused by uh, two stars that are binaries, as in they're gravitationally interacting and they're orbiting each other. Um, or it could be caused, we don't think it's likely caused by the same kind of pulsation that is affecting Cepheids, but we don't really know. So that's why we want to look into it. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Philip. Hello. Yes. Hi, Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, th thank you for a wonderful talk. Very interesting. Um, wonderful ahead, explanation. Um, my question has to do with um, how Edwin Hubble utilized um, the candle yardstick that Henrietta Leavitt discovered. Um, specifically, the Hubble constant keeps getting updated and changed. Um, is that somehow a function of the type of uh, Cepheid star that was used, uh, uh, 
the location of the cepheids or interstellar dust. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on why the Hubble constant keeps changing? Yeah, okay, so this is like a great question and it's also very much related to my research. So um, first, how uh, the first part is like how Hubble used these stars. So what Hubble did is he looked in the spiral nebulae and found Cepheids, the same Ceph like type of star that uh, Levitt had been looking at in the small Magellanic cloud. And then he was able to create those like Levitt laws, the period luminosity relations for the stars in the spiral nebulae. And then he could compare it to what Levitt had seen in the small Magellanic cloud and see that those were much fainter. So like Hubble could look at a star that was that had a period of five days in the small Magellanic cloud and compare it to a star with a period of five days in a spiral nebulae. And because they both had the same period, they should have the same brightness. But since they didn't, he could look at that difference in brightness to figure out how far away it is. So that's what that's what he used to actually determine the distances. To answer your second question, um, this is very relevant to my research because my PhD thesis was actually on measuring the Hubble constant using a different class of stars called Myras. And the reason why the value seems like it keeps changing is, is different at different times. So, um, so for everyone that doesn't know, the Hubble constant is the expansion rate of the universe at the present day. And because the universe is so big, when we say present day, what we really mean is like the expansion rate of the universe that's close to us. Because as we look farther away, we're actually looking backwards in time because it's taking so long for light to travel to us. Um, and so when people are trying to measure the Hubble constant, they're looking at the closest by galaxies to us. Like they're not looking far enough back that the universe is a lot younger than it is now. So that's what we mean by measuring the expansion today. Um, and historically, uh, there's been many um, re-measurements of the Hubble constant. And I think a lot of that was due to, like, at first, maybe not having the technique perfected, because even after the discovery of these standard candles, it takes a while to do it all correctly. It's a very difficult measurement, and it requires a lot of really careful analysis. Um, so initially, there was like a debate about whether the Hubble constant was 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec or 50 kilometers per second per megaparsec. But since the HST key project, which um, was like in the early 2000s, and that was led by Wendy Friedman, which uh, they found that the Hubble constant was about 70 kilometers per megaparsec. And I would actually say that since then, there haven't been any huge changes in the measurement of the Hubble constant, not a factor of two like it was before then. And I think that's really due to the consistency of the measurements and how well they uh, took care to understand all the possible systematic uncertainties that they could be dealing with. But maybe what you're alluding to is that now there's a debate about the more precise value of the Hubble constant. So there are some people, so there's, I've explained the way of measuring the Hubble constant using our local universe, but there's another way of measuring the Hubble constant. And that is by, instead of looking at our local universe, we study the CMB, which is the light that remained after the Big Bang. And based off of the CMB and assuming some model for like what the universe is made of. In our case, we assume that the universe's energy matter content is mostly dark energy. And there's also cold dark matter. So that's like what we call the standard model of cosmology. We have that. And then we have the observations from the Big Bang. We can sort of predict what the Hubble constant would be under those assumptions. And that gives currently, it appears to give a very different result from what we measure locally. So my advisor, my PhD advisor, um, he has made the most precise measurement of the Hubble constant using Cepheids um, in the local universe. And it's about 73 kilometers per megaparsec. But if you use uh, these CMB results, 
and their most precise measurement from the Planck team, then they get about 67, I think, or 68. So given the uncertainties on these measurements, which are both very low, this suggests a five sigma, which means like a one part in like 99.99999% like chance that this these two agree with each other. So with this difference, that sort of suggests that I mean, this actually does suggest that there could be physics that we're not taking into account that could explain the difference between these. So it's like a very interesting thing for people now, and that's called the Hubble tension. Um, but there are people that like disagree that this Hubble tension exists um, because uh, Wendy Friedman, the um, PI of the HST key project that I mentioned earlier, she uh, has also remeasured the Hubble constant and gets a lower value. So. Um, and she's doing that locally. So she gets a value that's kind of between Planck and uh, what Adam Reese's group is getting. And for the most part, though, people seem to be finding this tension. Um, I don't want to comment too much on it because obviously like being semi-involved, I'm trying to be like as unbiased as possible. But I do think maybe there's so many steps involved in this process um, people have to be really careful about what they're doing, uh, even using the same stars, like not everyone makes the same decisions and how the analysis is done. So that, that definitely causes some of the variation. But the reason why the numbers keep getting updated is that every year we get more data and we get better data. And then, you know, you go back and improve your measurement. And hopefully they converge on an answer eventually. Um, but right now it's a little up in the air, I would say, um, even if it's not new physics, which it does seem increasingly likely to be, then at the very least, it's a very complicated issue in astronomy that we haven't yet found the answer to, and is probably kind of interesting in its own right, because and it, there's many other local ways of measuring distances that all kind of favor a higher number and several ways of measuring distances uh, in the early universe that all kind of favor a lower number. So if there is something that we're doing very wrong, there may be many things that we're doing very wrong that we haven't yet found out, or it could just be a dis like an actual discovery, but I don't want to get into it too much because I don't want to like, yeah, <laughs> bias or influence anyone. Yeah. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much. Wonderful talk again. Thank no you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming. Okay, so I don't know if you wanted to say anything, Katie, but... Um, no, I guess we're, we're about end of time here. Um, unless anyone else had any last questions, but I think... Good, okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you again so much uh, for the for the presentation. It's really really fascinating. Um, I think people will find it really interesting when we post it up on YouTube as well. Um, and I do. Um, uh, I don't have time right now to talk about the transcription, like the you know the process of how to transcribe these particular notebooks. Um, but we will follow up with some additional information about that. In the meantime, um, if you're new to the trans to transcribing Project Phaedra, just make sure you take a look at our project-specific guidelines, because uh, our notebooks are a little bit different than the standard fare found in the Transcription Center. So, okay, I will end it here. So thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.